Rob, thank you so much for being here. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. All right, so to kick things off, we have some video that really illustrates what Boston Dynamics does. If, when it rolls, tell us what we'll be seeing. Great. So, you know, we've uh, introduced two products to the world. Uh, in, in 2020, we launched Spot, and you're seeing uh, Purina's uh, version of Spot here. Spot is a mobile inspection platform. It goes around the factory uh, taking uh, thermal measurements, acoustic uh, measurements, reading gauges, uh, making sure that the factory is operating in a healthy and uh, safe state. And this ends up being um, really the launching use case. You know, Spot's a multi-purpose robot, but this is the use case that we think is really scalable and uh, that's going to grow. And so we have customers like Chevron, uh, Ontario Power Generation, Anheuser-Busch, Purina, folks like that. And next, I think we're, I believe we're going to see Stretch. Yeah, so Stretch is You have a knack for naming them, I have to say. Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, tall, right? Stretch is tall. It How tall to, is Stretch? It has to reach the top of a container, a shipping container. So this is going to be a multi-purpose. So taller than me. Yeah, it's a, you know, it reach, reaches about 10 feet. And uh, there's about 800 million uh, containers moved around the world each year. A lot of them are full of boxes, like you see here. This is a back-breaking, repetitive uh, task. Um, and so there's just a ton of boxes to move. And we started with unloading uh, these containers first because it was kind of a, a nice, safe place to start the robot. It's almost in a cage there. But ultimately, this is going to be a multi-use robot. It's going to do any box moving task in the warehouse. Uh, we just, we're just launching it here. And we just delivered the first units of that uh, at the beginning of this year. Uh, companies like uh, DHL and Maersk and NFI and Auto are buying them. Now, Rob, uh, I don't know if you've heard, but we're in a bit of an AI boom right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know, so, we're wild, so big, right? Yeah. Um, are we possibly on the precipice of a robotics boom? I think it's going to be exciting. So, you know, AI is the brain, uh, the robot is the body, and together, I think we're going to build an entirely new industry that's basically going to change business, it's going to change the way we live. So it, it's going to have a big impact. Now, to sort of illustrate that point, we actually have a special guest. Spot, if you could please come out. Yeah, so we brought a Spot robot uh, for to demo to you guys today. And today... Yeah, you can get up, take pictures, go have a moment. Spot is, uh, normally it would autonomously walk around a factory. Today, Spot is being driven by uh, Hannah Rossi here. But Spot has onboard cameras that lets it see its environment so it knows where. So if it goes on and off this. Does this, it get stage fright? Not at all, not at all. But notice how so it's coordinating its foot placement with the steps because it sees the steps. So it knows how to adjust its own behavior to the environment. And that's because there's cameras. There's, there's actually five cameras all around uh, the robot. And so it builds a local terrain map. And so it knows sort of what it's getting into. <laughs> And you know, it, posing is cute, but it also, if you put a sensor on the back of its body, it can then point that sensor at something in the world. So legs just turn out to be a great way to get around in the world. Now we happen to have a payload uh, today, an arm. So we, we can configure this robot with a variety of sensors or tools. Today we have a, an arm to show. And one, because I think the real value of robots comes not only when you have a mobile platform, but when you have something that can do actual work. And so the spot arm uh, can grab things, open doors, uh, manipulate things. And so, and one of the things we pay attention to is coordinating the motion of the body and the arm together. You and I don't think about it, but you know, we can walk and move and touch something. And look, I'm, I'm walking around and still touching this front into the arm easily. So doing all of that coordination uh, takes a lot of work. And let's see, I'll, I'll show uh, one little simple task. I have a little toy here. and uh, It is a stress cube, is my understanding. The whole idea of these robots is, while Hannah's controlling it, she's just giving it sort of high-level gestures about what to do. The robot is managing its own motion, and it's actually going to pick up the ball itself. So she, well, it looks like it's going <laughs> to miss on the first try. So it's not flawless. Robots, there's no threat of them taking over, I, I assure you, <laughs> you know? Um, so, but they do have to manage an awful lot of their own motion in order for them to be useful, to ad ad adapt to the environment, whether the environment change, if, if a uh, box is in the way today and then it was tomorrow, we're going to miss twice in a row. Well, anyway. Uh, uh, but, How often does that happen? Uh, not that often, but sometimes. Yeah. You know, so I think the lights in here maybe confuse, the, confuse it a little bit. But we just launched the door opening module for this. So now the robot can go through a factory 
and see the door handle, open it, and, and help it move through that space. So um, I think we'll uh, maybe stop there. Maybe we'll show them one little fun gate. Uh, you know, yeah, we do the dancing. The dancing is not, not for pay or, or uh, pay work. Um, but you know, I do think that uh, there's an inherent interest, right? The robots are interesting for reasons that you know, we sort of have been looking at living, moving things our whole lives. And so it's sort of easy to emotionally identify with something that moves around in a world like that. So I think we'll let this sit down at this point, and we can proceed with. Spot, sit. Yeah. Oh, you're giving it the command? Uh, gee, Hannah. Please, you're, are you giving it commands? Hannah's basically saying dance. But that's, that's about it. Yes, but it manages its own movement. Now, I have to say, um, the robotics nerd in me thinks this is so cool. Um, but the financial journalist in me sits here and says, is this scalable? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So to make this business scale, there has to be a use case that is scalable that actually provides value to somebody. So as I said, with, with Spot, we think that value is in, in industrial inspection, basically keeping a factory up and running. Mm -hmm. Um, but it also, so there has to be value in a use case. The robot has to be able to technically do it. Mm -hmm. and, and then there has to be, is, is it scalable? Is mm -hmm. there enough of it? Mm -hmm. And so getting all three of those things right is actually tough because you have to cross the chasm. We're, we're building a new industry here, mm -hmm. and you got to cross the chasm with a high value use case that is scalable that's going to pay for the development of these machines, which is still, this is an expensive thing to develop. Mm -hmm. They're How software. expensive? Well, you know, at least $100 million, frankly, to launch a product because you have to iterate on the hardware, their software. The first prototype, you're not going to be able to deliver because that's not going to be reliable enough. And so it takes time. Honestly, the folks who's, who are, there's a bunch of little companies standing up now. Mm -hmm. They say they're going to launch a product, a humanoid, in two years. Mm -hmm. I think they're blowing smoke. It's going Elon to be Musk has also years. actually been talking about humanoid robots as well. And he has. And, you know. Uh, also a, smoke? Well. Let's see. I think he's been watching too many science fiction movies. I think the fear mongering is a little bit overblown. But you also have to take Elon seriously, right? He has uh, a factory behind him. So that if he can build the robot, he can just be his own consumer and use it. They will know how to scale manufacturing, because you're only going to get these things to be affordable is if you can build enough of them and get the cost down. And they have the software wherewithal. On the other hand, he's saying things that don't make sense to me. Like, like what? Um, you're going to purposely make the robot slow and weak because that's going to make it safe. I don't get that part. You know what? You want to make robots that are strong and powerful, and that's, that's the only way they're going to be useful. And so I think that's just going, we're definitely going in the opposite direction. Now, what are the use cases for Spot that you're most excited about? You mentioned Nestle, Purina first. Yeah, so industrial inspection in the process industry mm -hmm. is, I think, a, a huge and scalable market. But there's other really important use cases out there. We've had Spot at the Fukushima nuclear power plant. It's been at Three Mile Island. It's been at Chernobyl. Anytime you have a dangerous situation where you really don't want to put a person in there, send a robot for sure. Uh, we have public safety officials, police using it. If they have to serve a warrant to a murder suspect, you don't want the cop opening mm -hmm. the door, right? Mm -hmm. That is a very dangerous environment. Mm -hmm. And so having a robot mediate that first contact with a potential suspect mm -hmm. is actually going to be safer for mm -hmm. folks. And so I think there's a, a whole variety of potential use cases. Mm -hmm. uh, we definitely want to build all of our robots mm -hmm. to be platforms and have multiple use cases. But again, you got to have that launching use case that gets you across the chasm. Mm -hmm. Now, we may be expecting too much for, from our robots, perhaps, but what do the risks look like? Well, you know, I, um, I don't see much risk here. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the real risk. Godfather of AI, Jeffrey Hinton, very concerned about AI powered battle robots. The apocalyptic view, not for you. I just don't, I don't, I don't see that. I think AI is going to enhance the capability of these robots. They're going to be, but they're tools that we are building, you know? They are going to have off switches. Mm -hmm. uh, I just really don't see uh, the. Uh, the revolution happening. It's not something that I worry about. I think I've been developing robots for 30 years. We struggle, we work so hard to get them to do something reasonably well in, in, in repeatable fashion. Um, we're not about to take off. 
<laughs> the apocalyptic view is not in our immediate future, to say the least. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you got to start with the cubes, I guess. Um, <laughs> right, right. They couldn't pick up the cube. Um, but one of the other things that people often that often comes up when people talk about robots is the idea that robots will take jobs. What is your view on the relationship between human jobs and robotics? So you know, every new technology has changed work, and robotics will be the same. Mm -hmm. But the the jobs this robot is doing is a very, it's, it's a job that frankly is so boring, people don't do it very well. You know, can you, do you want the job where you're walking through the factory with a clipboard recording temperatures and pressures and gauges repetitive, repetitively every day, multiple times a day? Basically, people are, suck at that job. They'll either not do it or they'll do it incorrectly. And you really want to reserve those skilled technicians for fixing the equipment, mm -hmm. not finding the problem. And so the robot's actually going to help enhance the productivity of those people. And stretch, I showed unloading those containers. It can be 120 degrees in the summer inside that container. Um, that's a brutal mm -hmm. place to work. Mm -hmm. um, so what's really going to happen is the people who used to unload those containers are now going to operate the robot. Mm -hmm. We had the concept of a robot wrangler job, which is it doesn't take an advanced degree, mm -hmm. but you, the, per, the person who used to work in that warehouse is now going to enhance their mm -hmm. skills by learning how to work with technology mm -hmm. and manage robots. And our customers like DHL and Maersk are excited that that is actually going to attract mm -hmm. talent to them. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that in the end robotics could even be a driver of economic growth? Absolutely, because I think it can enhance uh, overall human productivity. So is it the sort of thing that it's an you know efficiency game in the end? It's, it, well, part of the, it's, it's efficiency, but, but look what's happening demographically. The rich world, the population is already declining, right? China, Japan, Korea, they don't have birth rates that are actually replacing their current population. Mm -hmm. We're going to need robots mm -hmm. to keep up the production. And, and people don't want to do some of the work that mm -hmm. these robots are doing now. Now, in terms of what's next for Boston Dynamics, what happens now? You have spot, you have stretch. What's the next hill you're well, gonna climb? So our, our next, uh, uh, the robot that we've been developing for years, our humanoid uh, Atlas, I think there's a real role for a two-handed mobile manipulation mm -hmm. robot What's out What's that there. role? What does that look like? Well, I think it could be in manufacturing, some place where you have more dexterous manipulation. So, you know, there's, there's been robots in automotive factories for years, but you know, they only do a single task in a very highly controlled environment. Mm -hmm. If you could build a robot that could pick up anything, mm -hmm. anywhere, mm -hmm. uh, you could then start to do this heavy lifting in a, a wide variety of ways, either in logistics or in manufacturing, or maybe mm -hmm. getting your baggage to you faster than the airlines can do it right now. Yeah, and now we have thir about 30 seconds left. What does the future of robotics look like, and will these be in our homes any time uh, in, in, in my it, lifetime? Within, yes, within it your life, my lifetime. I, I, think, okay. I think it's going to take between 10 and 20 years before these things are in your homes. You know, 20 is actually not as long as I was expecting. Long, right? No, that's not that long at all. These are expensive right now, and mm -hmm. we're starting with industrial applications mm -hmm. because you have to you know, have enough uh, economic activity to warrant the price. Mm -hmm. But as we get better and better at these and we generalize them, they're going to get cheaper, mm -hmm. the capability is going to be there, mm -hmm. and yeah, I want one in my home eventually. Well, you have them in your office, is my understanding. Yeah, they're everywhere. <laughs> Rob, thank you so, so much. Dr. Rob Plater. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. Spot, thank you as well. Right, you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna roll out. Oh, he's walking backwards. Okay, okay, I can work with that.